Co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, Dorothy Day was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1897. The family moved to the West Coast and survived the San Francisco earthquake in 1906, but lost everything they owned. When her father found a job in Chicago, the Day family moved into a tenement there on the city's south side, a big step down in the world. Dorothy Day's understanding of the shame and suffering people feel when they fail dates from this time. When her father was appointed sports editor of a Chicago newspaper, Dorothy and family moved into a comfortable house on the north side of the city. Here she began to read books by authors such as Upton Sinclair and Leo Tolstoy, books that stirred her conscience. Awarded a scholarship to the University of Illinois in 1914, Day was a reluctant scholar. After sophomore year, she dropped out of school and moved to New York, where she found a job as a reporter for The Call, the city's only socialist daily newspaper. She covered rallies and demonstrations and interviewed people ranging from doormen and butlers to labor organizers and revolutionaries. In November 1917, Day was one of 40 women who went to prison for protesting in favor of women's right to vote at the White House. They were sent to a rural workhouse where they were treated badly. When the women responded with a hunger strike, they were finally freed by presidential order. Raised in the Episcopal Church, Day began making occasional late-night visits to St. Joseph's Catholic Church on 6th Avenue in New York. While she knew little about Catholic belief, Catholic worship and spiritual discipline fascinated her. She saw the Catholic Church as the Church of Immigrants, the Church of the Poor. In 1924, Day began a four-year common-law marriage with Forster Batterham, an English botanist she had met through friends. He was an anarchist who was opposed to both marriage and religion. In a world filled with cruelty, Batterham found it impossible to believe in any god. But by this time, Day's belief in God was unshakable. They often quarreled about God and religion. A few years before she met Batterham, Day had been pregnant, the result of a love affair with a journalist. That pregnancy resulted in what she called the great tragedy of her life, an abortion. The affair and its awful aftermath was the subject of her novel, The Eleventh Virgin. At the time, she believed the abortion had left her barren, so when she became pregnant with Batterham, it seemed to be nothing less than a miracle. Tamar Teresa Day was born in 1926. Overwhelmed with gratitude, Dorothy arranged to have Tamar baptized in the Catholic Church. After Tamar's baptism, there was a permanent break with Batterham. In December of that year, Day herself was baptized and received into the Catholic Church. Before long, she met Peter Morin, a French immigrant 20 years her senior. Morin was a former Christian brother who had left France in 1908. He was working as a handyman at a Catholic boys' camp in upstate New York, receiving meals, use of the chaplain's library, living space in the barn, and occasional pocket money. Morin had a vision of society instilled with the basic values of the gospel in which it would be easier for men to be good. What they should do, Morin said, was start a newspaper to publicize Catholic social teaching and promote steps to bring about the peaceful transformation of society. Day readily embraced the idea. Everything in her life, her family past, work experience, and religious faith, had prepared her for this. The first copies of The Catholic Worker sold for one penny. The paper was an immediate success. Within six months, 100,000 copies a month were being printed. The Catholic Worker expressed dissatisfaction with the social order and took the side of labor unions. Its vision, informed by the gospel and Catholic social teaching, wasn't only radical, but religious. Morin's essays in the paper called for a renewal of the ancient Christian practice of hospitality to those who are homeless. By the time winter arrived, an apartment was rented to house ten women, and soon after, a place for men. Next came a house in Greenwich Village, then two buildings in Chinatown. The Catholic worker grew and became a national movement. By 1936, there were 33 Catholic worker houses spread across the country. When asked how long their guests could stay, Day said, we let them stay forever. They live with us, they die with us, and we give them a Christian burial. We pray for them after they're dead. Once they are taken in, they become members of the family. Or rather, they always were members of the family. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Catholic worker also experimented with farming communes on Staten Island, in Pennsylvania, and in upstate New York to grow food for the soup kitchens. What got Day into the most trouble was her pacifism. In her view, nonviolence is at the heart of the gospel. 
For the first two centuries of its existence, the early church took the command of Jesus to St. Peter seriously. Put away your sword, for whoever lives by the sword shall perish by the sword. Dorothy Day took that command just as seriously. For many centuries, the Catholic Church had accommodated itself to war. Popes had blessed armies and preached crusades. In the 13th century, St. Francis of Assisi had revived the pacifist way that had characterized the early church. But by the 20th century, it was unknown for Catholics to take such a position. That would change. Concern with the church's accommodation to war led Dorothy Day to Rome during the Second Vatican Council. She was one of 50 Mothers for Peace who went to Rome to thank Pope John XXIII for his encyclical Peace on Earth. She took part in a fast expressing our prayer and our hope that the Council would issue a clear statement put away the sword. The fasters had reason to rejoice when the Constitution on the Church in the Modern World was approved by the bishops. The Council described any act of war directed to the indiscriminate destruction of whole cities or vast areas with their inhabitants as a crime against God and against humanity. The Council also called on nations to make legal provisions for conscientious objectors and made it clear that Catholics could claim to be such based on their faith. The Council also taught that those who obey commands which harm the innocent and defenseless are criminals. Day lived long enough to see her achievements honored. In 1967, when she made her last visit to Rome, she was one of two Americans invited to receive communion from the hands of Pope Paul VI. Notre Dame University presented her with its Laetare Medal, thanking her for, quote, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, unquote. In her later years, when she was no longer able to travel, she received a visit from Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who pinned Day with the cross worn only by fully professed members of the Missionary Sisters of Charity. Needless to say, many people considered Dorothy Day a saint. No words of hers are better known than her brusque response. Don't call me a saint. I don't want to be dismissed so easily. She once remarked, If I have achieved anything in my life, it's because I have not been embarrassed to talk about God. Dorothy Day died on November 29, 1980, age 83. In 2000, the Vatican approved a request made by Cardinal John O'Connor of New York to have her considered for canonization. Today there are 213 Catholic worker communities in 10 countries.